Hi there and welcome to the Pondering Dam podcast, where we talk all things teaching, education, pedagogy and technology. I'm your host, Danny Summerall, and if you're new to the show, make sure you leave a review and share with your peers. Connect with me on Twitter, Instagram and YouTube at Pondering Dan, as well as at PonderingDan.com. My guest this week is teacher and digital learning coach, Tanya LeClaire. Tanya is Canadian born and bred, but resides in Seoul, South Korea, where she works at the Seoul Foreign School. She's an Apple Distinguished Educator, Google Certified Innovator, and Microsoft Innovative Educator, among many other things. Tanya has presented at many different workshops around the world, and notably for me, at the Apple Distinguished Educator Institute on the Gold Coast in 2019, where I was blown away by her presentation on the importance of white space in design, uh, something which I know nothing about or knew nothing about until then. You can find Tanya on Twitter at Tanya Lee Claire and at tanyaleeclaire.org, which I'll put the description, uh, put those links in the description. So hi, Tanya. Hi, Dan. Yeah, how are you? Nice to be here. Great, yeah. how are you? Yeah, excellent, thank you. So you're um, all holed up at home at the moment. Um, I Teaching am. virtually. <laughs> well, no, I'm actually, I'm not teaching virtually yet. I'm preparing for that. I'm okay. um, doing a lot of discussing about that, just in case that should happen. But uh, no, I was outside today in minus 10 weather, so that was not enjoyable. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah. So it's, um, it's quite fascinating to hear about all these educators that are having to teach from home and it, you're not doing it yet, but um, I guess this uh, you coronavirus know, you know. is very serious. So. <laughs> yeah, we're taking it very seriously and just making sure we're prepared if we should have to be in that position as yeah. well. So Best yeah. to be prepared. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much for being part of the podcast. I'm really excited. And um, um, as I mentioned in your intro, I met you at the Apple Distinguished Educator Summit um, and where I realized that I didn't know a lot about presentation design or what even white space was. I hadn't thought about that sort of stuff. So, um, but it was really fascinating. And I think for anybody that um, does a lot of presentations, not just teachers, but you know, anybody in business, any students, any, a lot of people will get some sort of benefit from this today, I'm hoping. So um, I thought we'd probably start though with um, how you ended up in South Korea. Sure. Um, well, I've been teaching internationally for about nine years. Um, I was in Abu Dhabi for five years at a few schools. Then I was in China for three, and now I'm in Korea. Um, I basically started going internationally with my teaching because at home, where I'm from in Nova Scotia at the time, there were not a lot of jobs I would have had to substitute for quite a while, and I really love travel. So I decided to go overseas for what I thought would be two years. <laughs> <laughs> now it's nine and it's probably going to be a lot more. Uh, I just love the lifestyle. I love to travel. Um, international schools are wonderful places and you just get to meet so many wonderful people. So I, I don't know, you get addicted and then you stay. So. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful though. Especially if you, if you do love traveling um, mm -hmm. to find um, really cool places that you can go and live and actually immerse yourself in the culture. So that's really good. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Um, so you're a teacher and a digital learning coach. However, you're also passionate about present presentation design. So how did this come about? Honestly, there's not one time I can remember, but I think I've always been into art and I've always been into design. Um, before I was a teacher, I was an events designer. I've always just loved visual things. I loved, um, you know, aesthetics. And so in my teaching, I would design uh, resources. I would, you know, a lot of times I would really care about the way things um, presented themselves because it really said a lot for the care that someone would put into their work or it would communicate a message and the way something was designed. So I just started to care about that. And then as I progressed in sort of speaking at workshops and then working in educational technology, I was doing web design and I was doing a lot more resources and I was speaking at workshops and that kind of lent itself well to understanding presentation design and how we think about the way our messages are being sent and that kind of um, the aspects of presentations or sessions that can be communicated visually. So yeah. it's just something I started to like a lot. Yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering, um, as you're talking about that, whether mm -hmm. uh, with your experience with uh, presentation design and starting to go to different conferences and presenting and, and doing a lot with ed tech as well, um, 
did you sort of find that you were becoming that point of contact? Um, a lot of people were starting to come to you saying, hey, Tanya, what do you think of this? Or what's your advice? Is that, is that what was happening? Yeah, that did happen. And it still does. And I love that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I, I also planned a conference for three years in China as a part of my role as the coach there. And so I would be coaching people in how they uh, design their presentations and their workshops. And that would be anything from the content to, you know, the activities, the resources. Um, but that also was the presentation and the slides and how much information they shared visually as opposed to just speaking it. Um, yeah, so people do come and, and consult with me a lot. And they would see mine and kind of be like, oh, how'd you do that thing? Or how'd you make it look like that? And so, yeah, it just mm. kind of snowballed. <laughs> yeah, which is amazing. And um, yeah. I, as I've, I'm only just thinking of this now, I remember after watching your presentation last year and um, I went back to work myself and started to think about what things look like as well. And, you know, in my space, you know, putting learning intentions and success criteria and different activities and, you know, videos and things like that on the Apple TV for my students to look at. Um, it was one of the first things I, I, I took back from the Apple conference was how to design that so that it's going to grab those students' attention a bit more. So thank you for mm -hmm. that. Um, Great. that. That's probably the one time I've actually stopped to think about it. So it's really interesting to sort of go back to where that started. And now do you think about it all the time? Because I find yes. once people start thinking about it, they can't stop. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. and, and I often tell myself that I'm not really a creative person, which I am in my own way. But as far as presentation design, I sometimes second guess it. I think, oh, is this right? I don't know. I'm just going to go white. <laughs> white background. Tanya says I can't fail with that. So. <laughs> yeah, if you so, leave space around your elements, that's always good. Yeah. yeah. So why, why is presentation design so important? Well, I really do think that how we communicate is not just the words that come out of our mouth. It's definitely what goes along visually. People really do learn so much visually. Um, so if you, for example, are competing with a slideshow, if you have too many words on that slide, or if there's just a lot of junk or, or clutter, that's really going to take away from the message you're trying to send. So I think that, you know, if our goal is communicating and teaching and, and helping others understand, having visuals that go hand in hand with what we're saying and help make us the focus rather than them being, you know, really confusing or perhaps uh, taking away from it, you know, that can be a benefit to us to, to think about that design and to consider how we're being supported with visuals and not being kind of uh, distracted from. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, um, that's really interesting. And I'm thinking of some of the good presentations I've seen before. And you, you talk about the presenter being the focused, the focus mm -hmm. more than the presenter. And I'm wondering whether you know, you see presenters standing in front of the big screen when they're talking. Yeah. Um, is that what they're doing there? Making themselves well, the center of attention as opposed to the slides or? Yeah. Like if you look at a Ted talk, for example, um, a lot of times the slides that are involved in Ted talks are super simple. It's maybe mm. one very massive image or one word with a lot of space around it. And that's meant not to take the attention away, but to make the attention or make us pay attention to the person speaking and really give them the stage. It's supporting them. So when mm. we think about design and how we might design presentations, we want to think about that as our aid to help send our message um, and not just the script <laughs> because a yeah. lot of people think it's the script. A lot yeah. of people use it as like a teleprompter. We don't want that. <laughs> no, no, because yeah. usually we can all read. So <laughs> yes, exactly. We don't need to read off of a slide. We yeah. don't need that to be, it's not a document. It's not a handout. It's a support. So, yeah. And that's yeah. really fascinating for me because as I'm progressing in my career, I find that I'm starting to do a lot more, um, presentations in public mm -hmm. um, yeah. so obviously that's something I need to think about as well and even thinking about you know professional development we've had today and the presenters that yeah. did did actually do that but those that didn't and you know thinking about well what can we do to make these a little bit better but so you yeah. talked about um, not reading the text you know mm -hmm. that, that's probably the worst for me to sit there and watch someone read from a slide but what are some yeah. other common mistakes that people make? 
Well, I think uh, a lot of times, especially if I'm in, uh, say, staff meetings or things like that, because this really, I mean, people don't think uh, sometimes that slideshows and staff meetings, there's a lot of jokes about PowerPoint, and you know, in business, in education, everywhere. Um, and that's because a lot of times not a lot of thought is put into them because we don't have a lot of time. Yeah. Um, or it's used again as the teleprompter, but sometimes I guess using images that are too pixelated or that have stuck, you know, stuck photos and uh, watermarks over them. That's kind of a, a huge no, no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> again, with the text asking people to read too much, you know, if you want, if you want to have some text on there, okay, but just not paragraphs, basically you want to have as minimal amount of text as possible and try to make it something that's not competing um, with the person presenting, so no lists and things like that. Um, mm. I like having, you know, visuals that take up the screen or that can, uh, I guess if they're too small and you're squinting your eyes, that's really hard to, to see. So really nice, big, beautiful visuals and, and thinking about where you're going to be presenting that. Is it going to be on a screen the size of the, you know, the Apple auditorium? Well, think about the colors. Is it too bright? Are people's eyes going to hurt? You know, think about where you're presenting so that the images you do choose are not um, hard to see. Um, and I did talk about white space at Apple. And what I meant by that was basically the negative space surrounding elements. So surrounding pictures, surrounding text, surrounding blocks of text, things like that. If you don't have space surrounding them and, and having some margins around things, um, sometimes it can be hard for the audience to find a focal point. And that's not to say that images can't go full screen. I love that as well. But there's a time and a place to use white space to benefit what you're trying to show. Um, and Apple, again, like I mentioned them before, they, they do such a great job of that. You know, they'll show the iPad or the iPhone right in the middle of a screen with nothing else on it. Maybe it's a whole black screen with just the phone in the middle. That's using negative space to, to make that focal point. So that's some another kind of thing that people don't always think about, but that's really beneficial when it's used properly. I yeah. think um, I think a lot of people, when they think about good presentations, um, do think about Apple. Um, this mm -hmm. isn't an ad for Apple, but <laughs> I mean, they do do presentations they do very well. They do a good well. job. They yeah, do a really, do. really good job. And, um, yeah. you know, and you see that mimicked um, so much now yeah. in the business world, especially when you look at um, product releases, because even mm -hmm. you look at Samsung or Huawei now, you know, their um, product launches are just like an Apple product launch. Exactly. You know? Yeah, and they really started a style. They really did. And, um, yeah. And it's interesting to think my mind just goes to Steve Jobs because really mm -hmm. it's you go back to all his old videos yeah. of him introducing the yeah. iPhone or the iPod and uh, yeah. So thinking about um someone that might be guilty of always putting a lot of text on a <laughs> presentation slide and they've got something coming up and you know they know their stuff um but they're just not good at that presentation design. So how can how can those simple design principles improve their presentation? You know, maybe looking at it from baby steps for them. Mm -hmm. Well, there are four principles in particular that I love talking about. And I know that a lot of people in the design world love talking about them, especially in education because they're easy to remember. And it's CARP, C-A-R-P, um, not the fish. Um, and you could make, you could mix the letters around and make another word that I won't say on, on here. Um, but, <laughs> but basically it's contrast. So thinking about contrasting colors, not putting, you know, a very light text on top of a light, light background, you know, making it so that people can see properly. So dark colors on light backgrounds or vice versa. So thinking about contrast, uh, thinking about alignment. Um, so that could be alignment of images. So maybe having them lined up, maybe right aligned center or left aligned, um, not having things dispersed all over a page so that the eye doesn't know where to look. So that's another thing people can think about. Um, repetition. Repetition is important in design because it builds unity. That, that could be repeating colors. So for example, if you have a presentation, um, maybe repeating one primary color and a couple of secondary colors throughout it. That way there's a cohesive style going on. Um, and that could be in the fonts you choose, you know, having bold header fonts that are the same and then a paragraph or a smaller font, like a subheading type font that's a bit different, but still co uh, consistent throughout the design. And this isn't just for presentations. This is really for any design. Um, and then the last one is proximity. So putting like things together, 
um, grouping up objects. So uh, for example, um, thinking about maybe not so much in, in presentations, yes, but even just thinking about things like, like imagine a business card and someone's address is all over the place. No, you'd want it all in the same place. So that's proximity. So those are just some different design or, or different design principles to think about that are really simple. And then if someone's super new to it, then they can utilize really great tools online like templates, like uh, some of the templates you get either, say you're using Keynote, they give you a lot of beautifully designed templates that you can just take and put your own information in. Or you can download some templates online, um, Slides Go or Slides Mania. They give you free templates that you can upload right to, let's say, Google Slides as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. And there's a... Um... There's another one that I use a lot for poster making, but I know they do slides as well, mm -hmm. which is Canva. Do you have you oh, used yes. that? Yeah, and it's actually Canva free is for one educators. Of my favorites. Yeah. yeah, and Canva it's actually like free for best. educators now as well, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's a few things you have to email them to get that free stuff. But yeah. I mean, you do, but that's okay. Yeah, we, love, we do. If I it's free, them. it's good. Yeah. They're an Australian brand, I think. I know. Yeah, I know. Which, I actually I use Canva for so many things. I can't even count. I've used yeah. Canva again and again. And I have to say there's one more that I really love that I just remembered. Um, and they're really stepping up the game too. They, I just uh, started looking into them a few months ago, but recently I, I got a pro version of an account with Visney, V I S M E. Um, oh, they I think really I have saw some you tweet really about that. Really wonderful. Recently. Yeah. They have just some of the um, templates that they have and the way like infographics in particular, you can adjust a lot of the graphics with your own data. And that's just something I haven't seen with anyone else. No, no love lost to Canva. They have my heart, but Visney is kind of taking a piece of it as well. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, amazing. I'll, yeah. I'll have to look that. I remember seeing it on your Twitter feed recently yeah. and I thought I'll open that in another tab and I'll get back to that mm -hmm. later. And I haven't yep. got back to that later. So I will have to make sure now I will go back to that. Yeah, You definitely have to check it out. They have presentation templates as well. Yeah. Um, something else that I know that you've been working on a little bit as well is a, project or a Google Innovator project. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, my summer was pretty crazy because after Apple Distinguished Educator Institute, I went to the Google Educator or Google Innovator Academy and I mix the names up all the time. But yes, um, <laughs> it's because I love both Apple and Google equally. Um, but a part of the Innovator program is you do a project for the year and they support you in that with mentorship and and things like that um, and just inspiration you have kind of a group of cohort of people you can call on if you need them their help and things like that and my idea was to uh, develop a resource uh, focusing on communication design and I chose to do an ebook uh, with potential for maybe a website or something like that um, and I've decided to narrow the focus to presentation design with a uh, kind of look at three different types and that can be a talk or a session where you're just kind of speaking to an audience, a workshop where you're interacting and teaching, or a, say a staff meeting, which is something we do all the time, but we don't often think about how to design those presentations. And this can be anywhere from walking through some of the best practices that educators or leaders might want to think about when they're designing the flow and what might happen, the activities, um, anywhere to the visuals, to the resources and how they share. So. It's just in the very beginning stages. I'm literally just making like a document with notes on it at this point, but that's the goal. <laughs> wow, it sounds amazing. Yeah. You'll have to let us know when that's um, coming out yeah. because I know a lot of people will be after to, it. Yeah, probably yeah. August. That's when August. I'm supposed to have it done. Yeah, so it's yeah. going to be, it won't be a, a novel-y type, or what am I supposed to say? It won't be like a chapter book, if, <laughs> if that's what you're thinking. It's probably going to be more like just a guidebook with some, tips, tricks, ideas, checklists, a little bit of rationale, but not too, not too heavy on the, yeah. the reading. Yeah. Sounds amazing. So obviously yeah. when, when you release that, you'll tweet that out to the world, will you, or, and, and put oh, it on your website? Yes. And... Excellent. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So I guess we'll all have to um, wait really patiently for August to come around. <laughs> and now that we've done this podcast, that's probably added a bit of pressure to you to get it done by then. Too, oh God. Right? The more people I tell, the more I'm like, well, I guess I have to do it now, but yeah, it'll, it'll happen. It may uh, be a pamphlet by the time I'm done. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. So you t already talked a bit about your favorite tools. Um, mm -hmm. Was there any other ones that, um, 
teachers or well, not not doesn't have to just be teachers, but is there any yeah. other really good ones that you like? Well, um, mention my favorites for sure. Um, I think it really does depend on your context. Like for example, in China, I couldn't use Google stuff um, when I lived there. So I was really heavily reliant on Keynote and even PowerPoint is, is, has a lot of great design tools. And a lot of people in business actually use PowerPoint. It's really come along in the last yeah. you know, little while, but um, so using PowerPoint is, is just as great. Um, I really do love though, I oftentimes I'll get templates on sites like Slides Go or Slides Mania. I'll pop them into say a Google slide and then I'll completely revamp it on my own based on something I saw somewhere else. So for me, it depends on how you're sharing. If I'm sharing online and I want to share a collaborative document, I'll use Google Slides. If I want to do something that's uh, got a lot of cool animations and maybe some great transitions, I'll use Keynote because Keynote's got those really awesome, you know, magic move or line draw features that I love. Um, exporting that as a movie as well is wonderful. So I'm a huge fan of Keynote and, and I'm just, you know, an Apple girl at heart. Um, but again, you know, if you're looking for some really interesting new designs and you want to explore Canva and Visme, those I think are my top uh, graphic tools. Um, and there's a lot of them out there, but those I, I would say are my favorites. And if yeah. you're going, you know, and you're delving into how to support your presentation with follow-up emails, then looking at MailChimp and their design tools to create really cool visual emails to follow up with some resources. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I'm, I've written half of those down. Some I of can them always I use as well. Tell so, you them, yeah. yeah, I can. Yeah. I like um, MailChimp I use to build templates to make kind of more visually, like, you know, like those marketing emails that have images and stuff in them. Well, yeah. you can build those on MailChimp for free. And then you can just like forward yourself a copy of what you built and then forward that to other people. So, well, I know, don't tell MailChimp I said that, but well, yeah, guess, anyways. Guess yeah. what I'll be doing after this call? Yeah. <laughs> Exploring MailChimp yeah, because that it sounds out. fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you made me think of another question when you were just talking before, because sure. I, I also use a lot of keynote and one thing I love about it is the animations. I guess mm -hmm. for me, I love teaching students how to use those animations to create not so much presentations, but just to create interesting things. And yeah. Is there in a good presentation, what, what are the limits with animations? Should we use them? That's a, a lot good question. Or? Mm -hmm. Hmm. So my answer to that question um, is use it when it supports what you're presenting in a way that doesn't distract from you as the presenter or for, for kids that it doesn't distract from them when they're, when they're doing it. I love magic move and I love how you can, you know, build things in and out and all these kind of cool things. But if it's just so frilly and so, you know, jumbled up with stuff and it doesn't make sense anymore, that's when you've gone too far. I honestly like sometimes I'll take magic move and I'll, you know, say a picture is on one slide and then the next slide, you just move it just slightly. Well, that little transition with magic move where you've just moved the picture slightly gives it a parallax feeling that you would experience say on a website. So you don't always have to move it from one side of the page to the other, just a very slight, you know, adjustment of it can almost give that floaty feeling that you get on the web and it can turn your presentation from something that looks more static into something that's kind of like moving a little bit and it's not even taking away from what you're doing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Really, yeah. I yeah. Do, like, that's really yeah. interesting. I'll be yeah. probably more conscious of that as well. And um, we're, we're just about finished, but I wanted to touch on something that I think I'm sure it was you that, um, mm -hmm told me about this um ages ago and um and that was whenever you are doing these pre presentations if you're doing it in an auditorium or you're using a tv play it mm -hmm. off of those devices first because then you're going to notice yes. those things <laughs> that we don't want in good presentations mm -hmm. absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. Always see where you're going to be playing it, and and you know check your spelling too. I was, oh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes. I actually, I spelt the word wrong when I was at Apple in my presentation, and they caught it right before I went on stage. And I was like, well, this is the most embarrassing moment of my life. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and and there's um, no other yeah. career gets judged as much for spelling mistakes as teachers, right? No, that's. I just like to tell people up front: don't expect too much with the spelling. But that's why Grammarly <laughs> is important. I always yes. like. I also like Grammarly. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> yes, I, I know a yeah. lot of people rely on Grammarly. I like to pick up my own. I like to live on the wild side with that. Oh, you live <laughs> on the edge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, Tanya, mm-hmm. for being part of the show today. Thank you. Um, again, you can find Tanya on Twitter. Her handle is at Tanya Lee Claire. And her website is tanyaleeclair.org. Um, if you have any questions for Tanya, obviously you can uh, get in touch with her through Twitter um, and you've got your contact page there. Um, but you can also email them to me as well and I can forward them. Um, my email address is dan at ponderingdan.com. So once again, to help this podcast grow, please like it, subscribe to it, rate it, share it with your peers. Um, and before we go, Tanya, do you have any parting words? Happy designing, everyone. Happy designing. Beautiful. I love it. (laughs) So thank you again. Um, So everyone, I hope you've enjoyed what you've heard. Tune in next week for more conversations around education. I'm your host, Danny. Until then, look after yourself. Bye. Bye.